thank you for the intro. So many of us are pretty good at bouncing, but some people are better at this than others. But inevitably, you do lose balance. So we want to know what happens in this case. So how will she gain balance? Her sand foot is on the balance beam, and she can only exert limited torques. So it's up to her appendages, her arms, her trunk, um, to rotate through their inertia and move the center of mass indirectly so that she can regain balance. So what is she supposed to do with her appendages? And this is what we're trying to answer. Let's see. So our hypothesis is that you would rotate your appendage in the direction that your stance leg is displaced. So we're approximating the center of mass with your stance leg. And we can step through this with a simple balance uh, model. So you have an inverted pendulum with the main mass. And you have two appendages. And the question is, how do you rotate these appendages to bring your center of mass back over your ground contact point. So because you're displaced in the counterclockwise direction, you need a clockwise torque to bring you back. And um, the two components of these clockwise torques can, be, can come from these two appendages. So these two appendages need to impart a clockwise torque onto your stance leg. So this also means that the appendage torques themselves are in the counterclockwise direction. So again, if your stance leg is displaced in the counterclockwise direction, you need to rotate your appendages in the same direction, which is, again, in the counterclockwise direction. So this will, there's a, um, because you're restricted by the pivot um, on the foot, this will induce a lateral ground reaction force. And this will bring this uh, main pelvis mic back over the ground contact point in the stabilizing direction. So there's another way we can think of this. Uh, so if you want to write some sort of control law, what is the relationship between your appendage torques and your stance leg angle? You can look at the control gains. So you want them to act in the same direction. So in that case, you expect that if in the same direction, your control gains are positive. Um, we also think that if you were to restrict one of your appendages, um, so your gains ne won't necessarily be the same. And so you need some sort of compensation strategy um, to compensate for the constraint. So we took human data to see um, if what humans do matched our expectations. So we had people just balance on one leg and restricted their ankle so they can only use the appendages to balance. There were no external perturbations in this case. So we empirically identified controller gains from their appendage angles and angular velocities um, and their appendage torques. And so from my expectations, we expect that the gain from the trunk, the swing leg, and the arm to be positive in the sense that they're going to act in the same direction as their displaced stance leg. Um, we also want to know what happens when we constrain appendages. And so we have four other conditions. We have a no constraint, which is what I showed before. We have trunk only, swing leg only, and arms only, which you can only use those appendages. And for the ones where we restrict the trunk, we are basically tying the trunk to the stance leg. And we're going to measure limb variance through the root mean square as a measure of how you compensate. So with um, our results, so from our uh, expectation, we think it's going to be in the same direction. And from our data, uh, it seems that people um, do have a positive gain, which means they are rotating their appendages in the direction that their stance leg is displaced. But how does this um, translate through the different appendages? So we have the trunk, the swing leg, and the arms. And the trunk and the swing leg act in the same direction, but the arms are actually in opposite directions. It's very small, but we think maybe perhaps because your arms have to act through the trunk, there's something perhaps different going on in humans. Um, so, and then we can also look at how constraints uh, lead to more appendage movement. So this is the um, RMS, so it's kind of how visible the motion is. And the arms are the most visible motion, even though they have the, smaller, the smallest gain. And if we only let you use your trunk, you have more movement. And the same holds with if we only let you use your uh, swing leg and also your arms. And there isn't data for the middle two because we had you cross your arms, so the data didn't quite make sense there. So if you were to constrain appendages, you would see more movement in the cases where you can only use them above the baseline case. Um, so back to our gymnast. She does something crazy to stabilize, but based on what we've heard, perhaps she is simply just rotating her appendages in the direction of her stance leg. And if we were to restrict her in some direction, you would see more movement. So thanks, and please stop by my poster. <laughs>on behalf of my graduate student Chang Kun Chang, I'm Sue Park. I'm going to present the central pressure um, trigger step-to-step -step transition criteria. When you run bipedal walking simulation, you should define 
the speed that you want to run on, and then you should set the uh, leg stiffness, and also you should define the touchdown angle so that your so that your model can switch from the single support stance to the double support phase. When you want to run at the different speed, you also have a different set of leg stiffness and a different set of touchdown angle. What actually occurs during the stance phase is you are applying the plantar flexor torque to proceed your body movement forward, and then which is followed by the center of pressure excursion in the forward direction. And then the experimental data show that when you actually, when your center of pressure reaches to the limits, such as metatarsal joint end, where you cannot really effectively apply the joint torque for forward movement, you step. So with this, um, Observation implies that when you are applying the sleep model, maybe your pivot point might be moved during the stand space in a forward way with the continuous center, pre center pressure position profile. So in this study, we proposed a modified SORA, modified uh, sleep model that has a forward progression of the pivotal point during the stand space with the continuous profile, which is observed from the data, similar from the data. And when it, the center of pressure point is reaches the metatarsal end, we initiated the double support phase. So in this case, the touchdown angle is not a predeterminant independent variable anymore, and it is calculated from the dynamics. Results show that the proposed model could reproduce the human um, GRF data for various gait speeds pretty well with a single model parameter K. And we also observed that the touchdown angle showed a high correlation with the leg stiffness. And then we, when we convert the, dimension, uh, convert the coordinate from the independent leg stiffness to the dependent touchdown angle, our results are pretty much coherent to the observation what we can get when we set the touchdown angle as a free scan parameter. Finally, our feasible solution set shows a speed dependent gate parameter changes, such as for the step length, our feasible solution set, when you have a fixed gain stiffness, uh, when you walk faster, your step length increased, which is consistent to the experimental data observed. If you want more about the details of the model, please stop by the poster. I'd like to acknowledge our funding source, NRF of Korea, and I have another poster this afternoon about the leg stiffness increases with the load to match the resonant-based center of mass oscillation. So for example, when you increase the speed, several observations show that your leg stiffness increases. So we, when we have a loading, uh, total leg stiffness increases, but when we normalize them by the body mass, it is pretty much similar to the uh, stiffness when you have the mass, the ratio, so which means that you have a similar resonant frequency. Thank you. All right, how are you guys doing? Um, my name is Rick Corey. I'm from Disney Research. Um, and I'm actually fairly new to the walking stuff, uh, so I actually did my, uh, my PhD work on perching things, on things that fly. So this is a video of a high-speed perching maneuver, but very much related to walking, I think, in terms of under-actuation um, and, and difficult dynamics. So when I went to Disney, I thought I was going to build some really cool birds, and then they said, we want something that walks. Um, so why does Disney want something that walks? That's the question that I keep getting. Um, so we actually built uh, walking things before. Well, not we. They did, actually. While well, Disney Imagineering, R&D. This is Lucky the Dinosaur. It's actually a bipedal robot. Um, here's a cool little video of this guy. Can't really hear the audio, but it does roar a little bit. And he walks. He actually does uh, hold part of his weight up. He does contact the floor. But you see that he has a big carriage in back of him. But we give the illusion that it actually walks. So the question, the natural question to ask is, can we actually build something that holds itself up and walks and balances on its own legs? So a couple years later, uh, fast forward, and uh, we have Miles. Miles is a bipedal walking robot. It's planar. Um, it's fully electric, torque controllable robot. Um, it's about three feet tall. Um, it weighs about uh, 36 pounds, which is, I guess, about 16 and a half kilograms. Um, and 
I want to make a shout out to Martin Lata, uh, who was, came um, to us from ETH and Sanaya and I, who came from uh, U Texas, who actually worked a lot on the mechanical design of this guy. Um, but we built him so we could actually experiment on actual walking. And for me, being a newbie, I had one of the biggest questions. The walking community has been talking about foot placement for a very long time. So there's so many different ways of placing your foot. So, uh, but everybody has their own hardware, their own gains, their own saturation limits on actuators. What if we just, you know, tested everything on a single platform? Um, and that's what we did. Um, so, you know, I sort of took the five, uh, you know, one of the five uh, most common, I think, foot placement uh, strategies and started playing with them in simulation and eventually on the real robot. So what I did is, you know, modeled the robot as best as I could in terms of the physics and actuator limitations and whatnot. Um, and started pushing it around in simulation. So what you'll see here is after about eight steps, he's going to get pushed uh, about 15% of his weight for about 0.2 seconds. And the idea is to try to quantify sort of the stability of this guy using the gait sensitivity norm um, with the foot length, uh, foot placement length uh, as the gait indicator. So this is um, fixed foot placement. It turns out, you know, he actually walks without thinking, without modulating folks foot placement, but as soon as he gets pushed, he sort of falls over. Um, this is inverted pendulum model without any impact modeling. Um, so he does a little bit better there. He kind of holds himself up for a second and thinks about it. This is a one-step capture point with the linear inverted pendulum model. So a little bit similar. This uh, next one is a foot placement estimator, which actually takes into account the impact, still using an inverted pendulum model. So it does actually a little bit better and smoother. And the final one, the foot placement indicator, actually takes uh, into account the full dynamics of the robot when it gets pushed. So um, sort of the meat of the, of the story is that, uh, you know, quantifying. So the top row is a gate sen the inverse of the gate sensitivity norm normalized to one. So FPE, uh, foot placement estimator, does the best, even though it doesn't have the most perfect model. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of, of performance, uh, you know, it, the FPI doesn't actually take into account the swing dynamics, so that could potentially be why the fixed one, of course, fails. And the bottom, the second row there uh, talks about how the max, the maximum force you could apply. So the, the actually the more higher fidelity model can take a bigger push. Um, and this is a, uh, we actually implemented walking on the actual robot. So this is miles walking stably. So he has four sensors at the, at the feet. So the prosthetic feet, we're actually still testing. So you can see he actually walks stably. And this next one is a few experiments pushing. It's just a passive bearing. So we're actually evaluating some of these things to actually come up with a quantifiable measure. And of course, we're Disney, so we like to see how silly we can make our robots, you know, right? Put a tutu on it and see what happens. And, uh, you know, it's a cute thing. So, you know, if you guys want to learn more, come to the poster. And we're actually, we have Miles here today, uh, today and tomorrow. He'll be around. If you want to take the tour, you'll get to see him walk. Thank you. Foot placement, very good question. Uh, I'm hearing a lot about it during this conference, and it's a very important one, but I'm actually here to talk about the uh, complementary question. Where is my foot anyway? So most of the uh, robotic systems uh, think about a good box somewhere in the body that tells you where the body is, and then some way of estimating where your foot is from it. And I'm going to talk about a way of going up the chain the other way by putting IMUs on the feet and doing an integration of the signals to find out where the feet are first. So accelerometers and angular rate gyroscopes give you signals that should be integrable to find uh, the actual position and orientation of, uh, of an IMU. But as many of you know, if you just do that directly, they're subject to divergent drift. And so you have to do various sensor fusion things to fix it. If you put it on the foot, though, it's subject to a special condition that allows you to get rid of the divergent drift by noting that the foot, when it's on the ground, has a velocity of zero. 
And so then you get the ability to reproduce paths through space like John's right foot while he walked around in one of the academic buildings. So my poster and the hardware demo and everything is about using foot-mounted IMUs, what you can do with them. Come talk to me about it. How to use unobtrusive, cheap, long-term uh, measuring using IMUs uh, to reconstruct foot motion. And the rest of the talk is just some examples about how this might work, okay? So what could you do with that? You could do science, such as measuring gait symmetry of left and right sides. Uh, you could measure the effects of terrain on the body. You could measure what people are doing when they're going up and down stairs if, they, if you think they use different strategies. You could measure clinical things like gait challenges uh, that you might present to a patient or variability in general or foot clearance like the boxes that I did not successfully hide there. Here is a video example of what it looks like to reconstruct foot motion from an IMU. Okay. So those are some steps. You can see the path looks a little bit different when it goes over the uh, obstacles here. It successfully turns around and everything. And this can be fairly stable for a pretty long period of time. You can use it to do all day monitoring. This here is a very high speed uh, trace that's uh, reconstructed from one of our team going trick or treating with his kids. So I'll let it run for a, a few seconds and you can see that, uh, that once they're going, you can see them walk up to people's front doors and get some candy and then eat it and then go away. <laughs> that looked like eating to me. I don't know about you. <laughs> Maybe that's my internal model having a problem with uh, representing it. Anyway, what was that? Regrettably, I did not get that much candy on Halloween. Uh, another thing you could do is chop up these all-day trials or other trials that you do in a laboratory to estimate uh, gait variability. So this is a, a study we've just completed about uh, the comparison between eyes open and eyes closed, and you can successfully get differences uh, in gait variability represented from this integrated IMU data. You might be interested in gait symmetry, and so you can put them on the left and the right. And while they don't localize relative to each other very effectively, you can tell whether the two feet are essentially doing the same motion or not by comparing them against each other. You might be interested in what happens when a person of interest, maybe they have a, a clinical problem that gives them an impairment or whatever, is presented with different challenges such as weird terrain. So you can see here that on uh, flat dirt and on a sidewalk, they're very, very regular. Uh, but if you put them on grass or gravel, the variability generally goes up. And if you put them on wood chips, the variable variability goes up quite a lot. This is a side view. So this is sort of swing phase the way you normally look at it in a simulation, for example. You can present them with locomotion challenges, like this figure eight walk that we uh, did in the clinic. Those are raw signals over on the right for angular velocity. And if you... Uh, do the trace out here, you can fit the kind of parameters that a clinician is interested in, in using, such as the uh, circles that make this figure eight for measures of smoothness or time. And if you're a roboticist, which I'm really not, you might be interested in uh, getting foot location without having to build a kinematic chain off of the other foot. Uh, and so that, that's something for you guys to think about, is whether this would be useful for robotics. And. Uh, there are some limitations that you can come talk to me about in the poster, but I am going to leave you with the take-home message in case you don't visit. A cheap, small IMU that one wears measures walking wherever one dares. Mount it down on the foot so in stance it stays put. Study stride length, width, speed, even stairs. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank my co-conspirator, Joe Cusimano. He has a poster as well, so I'm going to talk real briefly about both of those, actually, because um, they are somewhat related in the sense that one of the things that we're interested in is noise in the biological system, and we've talked a little bit about that this week. Um, but we're interested in the fact that all biological systems are inherently very, very noisy, much more so than most robots that are out there, um, that possibly Jesse's up in Michigan this week until he sorts that out. Um, 
And this has a lot of implications, both good and bad, and, and sometimes somewhat contradictory. So on the one hand, it's been sort of uh, proposed that increased gait variability can predict increased risk of falls in the elderly. And that sounds nice, but there's an awful lot of, me of um, sort of, I don't know, argument, I guess, about what variability of what. And nobody really can quite nail that down. Um, on the other hand, there are cases where variability can, introducing additional variability in the system can actually improve rehab outcomes. Um, and I don't have time to get into the details of that, um, but you can make it take advantage of variability in some cases. And so we're interested in this general question of how do we know what variability is bad and what variability is good, and how can we detect that, and how can we actually sort of make sense of some of that. So we started thinking about walking and how you can boil down walking to sort of its most simple thing. So at the end of the day, no matter what system, whether it's a human or a robot or a simple robot or a complicated robot, uh, in order to be walking, you have to take finite steps in a finite amount of time. So the ultimate state variables for walking ultimately reduce to stride length and stride time or step length and step time. And let's say you want to try and walk at a constant speed. Well, if you're trying to walk at a constant speed, then there's actually an infinite number of combinations of stride length and stride time that will achieve the exact same speed. So somebody asked um, Scott Delp last night, how do you deal with the redundancy problem? And usually the answer is the answer that he gave, which is you find some criteria and you optimize that criteria and you find the one solution within that optimization that actually is your one optimal solution. And our suggestion here is that, well, here's an infinite number of solutions that are all equally optimal in terms of satisfying the goal. And maybe people don't really need to find the optimal solution and they can live with a lot of variability in certain ways and only try and constrain variability that is actually the bad variability. So in this case, um, for this task, all the variability going up and down along the gem is what we would consider good variability or at least not relevant to achieving the goal of maintaining speed. And it's the fluctuation dynamics of things going on perpendicular to that goal equivalent manifold, that gem and that space, uh, that are the things that we're interested in. Variability is one thing that we're interested in, but we're also interested in step-to-step -step control of these kind of things. And I can tell you a bit more about how we actually assess that. But one of the things that we're interested in is finding a way to quantify essentially what is the statistical persistence from step to step of something. So here are two signals. They both have the exact same standard deviation. Uh, the one on the top obviously shows a lot of drift. So when the thing starts to drift down, it just keeps on going, keeps on going. And we would equate that with weak control. Okay? On the other hand, the one on the bottom is oscillating back and forth very rapidly. So there's very rapid corrections to any deviation in either direction. Um, and the paper we have published has computational models in it that sort of show that when you have weak control for a particular variable, you get patterns that look like what you see on top. When you very tightly control something, you get patterns that look a lot more like what you see on the bottom, independent of what the variability of those things is. And what we see in humans, healthy humans, is that all those fluctuation dynamics along that, that goal equivalent manifold essentially look a lot like what you see on top, and the fluctuations going perpendicular to that manifold look a lot like what you see on the bottom. And that's been published, at least in general. The question I have in my poster is, why are the elderly more variable? We have a couple papers and other papers that show that elderly are more variable. And there's two possibilities that we wanted to look at. And we can with these methods. One possibility is that the, they are more variable simply because they have deteriorated control. They're not able to achieve the tasks that we have here as well as they should be. Alternatively, they might actually still be doing the exact same thing as the young healthy subjects, but because of a large number of different physiological changes that are happening internally, they just happen to be noisier. So that's what I'm talking about. Joe is actually going to be talking about something more interesting, I think, which is actually the role of perception. He's going to be talking about two different things. One is, what happens if you have competing task goals? So you have multiple things you're trying to do simultaneously. And then you have this flexibility of what it is you're trying to do and what it is you're trying to achieve. The other is, what is the role of perception and in particular visual optic flow on these issues? And you'll have to ask him about that because I'm apparently done. Thank you. So the, <clears throat> the title of my poster today is Simple Tools to Measure Local Motor Stability and Maneuverability. Stability and maneuverability are important in real-world walking. 
to demonstrate this, if you would imagine trying to successfully navigate across this busy intersection that we saw earlier today, you require maneuverability to avoid the many other pedestrians also crossing the street. And you'd likely also require stability as you're walking through a crowd to resist a perturbation if you're accidentally bumped into. Can you move the microphone a little further? Please? Sorry, yes, is this better? There, is that better? Okay. A common method of rehabilitation after neurological injury is body weight supported treadmill training. This method of rehabilitation supports a percentage of the person's weight, allowing them to practice taking steps, whereas before they could not. This method of training is very good because it allows intense stepping practice. And it is also based on this idea of task specificity, which basically states that this training task simulates many of the aspects of walking. However, this training is still likely suboptimal because it does not challenge stability and maneuverability. Therefore, our aim is to, using this idea of task specificity, develop a device that can appropriately challenge the stability and maneuverability of each patient. To do this, we have a wide treadmill that's approximately four and a half feet wide by eight and a half feet long, and it allows the person to safely make lateral movements while they are walking. And it, we are also developing a visual feedback display that is able to present to the subject various walking, walking goals. We're also developing a robotic environment that can challenge their stability and maneuverability. This consists of ropes that are attached to the patient by means of a hip belt and routed through a system of pulleys and eventually connected to a motor that is on a magnetic rail which is in front of the patient here. Here's an example of two walking tasks that we could present. Um, here in the purple we have uh, the, the position of the center of mass. The patient is instructed that the task is to maintain the position of their center of mass projected in the transverse plane within a given walking path. This is a stability task where they are trying to maintain the position of their center of mass in a narrow straightforward walking path. In a maneuverability task, continuous directional changes are required to maintain the center of mass within the path. And as you can imagine, there are various variables that we could manipulate such as the angle and mag magnitude of the direction change as well as the frequency and regularity of the directional changes. Two examples of the different environments that we can place people in are here with virtual springs on the left. If a specific walking task is too difficult for a patient to accomplish successfully, we can, through the use of virtual springs, we can assist them. If the task is too easy, we can appropriately challenge them through perturbations or error augmentation. I should also mention that there's a, a load cell in line with this so we can use force feedback to control these forces provided by the motors. And so in a, ma a manner analogous to how body weight support treadmill training is able to progressively allow people to walk better by unloading them less and less, we aim to success progress people's maneuverability and stability by appropriately challenging them with these different environments. So please come and visit our poster to, for more details on exactly how we aim to improve rehabilitation with these methods, and thank you. So um, I wanted to start with a question. What should simple models do for us for locomotion? Um, one, one thought is that they should be able to explain general principles and observations, uh, perhaps across uh, the animal kingdom, uh, perhaps as well as robots. Um, and one example of that are the slip base, the spring-loaded inverted pendulum models, and the extensions thereof, like the bipedal slip, that have been able to make claims about ground reaction forces of both walking and running um, that are somewhat universal in nature. Uh, but what about a need for new models, new simple models for other unexplained principles. And I'm sure there are many. Um, you know, I, I, there's many that are being discussed here. There are many in the category of the stability of locomotion. 
perhaps many in, in the area of energetics. Uh, there's also this one about the, the nearly universal leg stiffness that we see across animals. And also some robots exhibit that as well. And that's what I want to focus on a little bit in the time remaining. So if, if the ground reaction forces are measured and the displacement of the leg is measured, we can get an effective stiffness by taking the, the ratio. And that can be normalized by dividing by the weight of, of an animal or robot and the original leg length. And if you plot that for a range of animals, and also there's a robot on there too, uh, it turns out that the relative stiffness is, uh, is relatively uh, in a narrow band. And, you know, keep this in mind that it's a little bit above 10. Uh, in fact, it's, it's probably somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, most often. And if we try to take a conservative slip model to predict uh, what's going on here, we see that, that first of all, there's, there's no prediction of cost of transport, so it doesn't say anything about energy. Uh, but also, we find that, that slip-based models are, for the most part, uh, they tend to be unstable in this range of relative stiffness. And there are, there are some fixes and adjustments. But the point is that there's not a lot of claims that a conservative model uh, can make about this uh, relative leg stiffness. So uh, what, what can other extreme cases of locomotion tell us that might lead to a different kind of model? And I want to focus on hip-based locomotion here. So here we have an above-knee amputee that quite literally has spring legs. Right? And nonetheless uh, can achieve highly, in, in my opinion, uh, certainly coming from a model perspective and a robot perspective, uh, highly stable, robust locomotion. And I would say that anybody that produces a robot that could do what this above the amputee could do, that would be a remarkable accomplishment. Um, so I, I tried to understand this with a simple model, uh, in fact presented some of that work last year, uh, where we just added a simple constant open loop torque and a simple damping uh, element to a slip-based model and looked at the effects. And I'll show you a little bit of, of that in, in a moment. I also have done work using the OpenSim platform to find a way to embed the simple model into a more complex multi-degree of freedom uh, simulation of locomotion. And by the way, this one is constrained to move to the sagittal plane and is not allowed to uh, roll pitch or yaw. So um, it is. Uh, has the center of mass dynamics similar to this, but it has multi-body dynamics in the limbs. And also in, in my lab, uh, we're currently looking at hip-based robotics. So this is a robot that, can, uh, that has two degrees of freedom at the hip. And hopefully soon I can, I can show demonstrations of, of it doing things based on this modeling framework. But again, what I wanted to do is show you what this might say about um, the relative leg stiffness. So if we start with a conservative slip model, and I show you the basin of attraction. We're here on the two, on the y and x axis, we have speed and velocity angle. Uh, in other words, two components of velocity. And that little dot in the center is a fixed point uh, on a uh, stride map or a per periodic uh, locomotion solution. And that slight little line is the basin of attraction. And you can see that if the system is perturbed in terms of the speed, i.e. a proxy for energy, it doesn't come back to that point. So it has, it has a somewhat narrow basin of attraction because of its conservative nature. But if we add hip torque and leg damping, um, and I'm just showing the non-dimensional values that are used here for the model, uh, we notice that there's, there's a big change right off the bat. And the first change is that it goes to an unstable solution. Many people that I've spoken to have guessed that it would actually become more stable, but it actually first becomes uh, unstable. And then a second bifurcation or a second change occurs as you keep increasing this torque and damping. And then it becomes robustly stable. And so we see this large basin of attraction, and then that continues to grow. Now, one of the points that I want to make here uh, that's going to be relevant in, in, uh, once I get to my, my last uh, two slides real quick is that the moments and, and by uh, indications or implications, the cost of transport must pass above a threshold for stable locomotion to exist for this system. right? So it has to go above a non-zero threshold. And uh, this is my last slide of results, so I can wrap up. So here it's, it's showing now, once we're above that threshold, we have stable locomotion. I'm plotting all those stable solutions as blue dots. Now if we tune the relative stiffness, uh, where, wh what does that do? And basically the, the main result is that we get a minimum in torque and we get a minimum in cost of transport, which is very close to what we see where all these animals and even some of the robots like to run. And I don't have time for the implications, but the cost of transport in moment get driven up by in order to get stability, but can be tuned down by leg uh, stiffness. This is a non-trivial kind of co-optimization. And uh, these uh, new models such as HipSlip can offer these new explanations as well as maybe doing new kinds of robots. 
And that's it. I'll, there's another poster on comparing radial and rotary forcing. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, uh, my name is Araki from Tohoku University, Japan. Uh, the motivation of this study is to understand why quadrupeds exhibit exclusively either trot or pace gait, according to the uh, animal species. For example, Wait. So yeah, maybe it doesn't work. Please just a minute. So for example, to, uh, for example, force exhibit uh, trot gate in middle speed locomotion, in which the uh, diagonal foot touch down at the same time like this and like this. On the other hand, the camel exhibit pace gait in the middle speed locomotion, in which the inspiratorial foot uh, touch down at the same time like this and like this. So we'd like to know why uh, why these animals exhibit uh, this gait pattern according to animal species. So in this study, we focus on the oscillating motion in the roll axis. Uh, this movie shows the camel locomotion, camel running, so uh, by watching these movies, camel exploits oscillating motion uh, to generate pace skate, I think. Uh, inspired by this uh, animation, we input the physical pendulum, like physical elastic pendulum uh, into our robot like this. As a result, our robot exhibits pace like gait like this. Piece. It is interesting, right? <laughs> so, uh, this is a, uh, a com comparison of our experimental result. In the left hand case, uh, we, uh, uh, left hand case shows the without pendulum, and the right hand uh, data shows the uh, with pendulum case. So, uh, as you can see from this movie, when the, uh, we did not implement a pendulum, so our robot exhibit uh, walk gait in low speed locomotion. And when we uh, increase the locomotion speed like this, uh, this robot exhibit uh, trot gait uh, like this. Movie. And on the other hand, uh, we, imp uh, we add the uh, uh, physical pendulum into this robot. Uh, so, uh, so this robot exhibit walk gait in low speed locomotion like this. And when uh, we increase the locomotion speed, uh, this robot exhibits pace gate by exploiting this physical pendulum. So uh, this result indicates that our robot exhibits uh, exclusively throw to a pace gate according to their uh, physical properties with exactly the same controller. I'd like to explain in detail the last slide. Uh, this is an overview of our robot. So to design this robot, uh, we uh, use some simplification. Uh, first, uh, we use a simple leg structure. This robot's leg have no knee and no ankle. Uh, this is uh, our motivation to understand the interim coordination in the quadruped locomotion. Interim coordination means the coordination between the leg movement. So we use this uh, very simple leg structure. And uh, in this robot, we use a phase oscillator as a basic component of CPG. So this uh, control of this robot based on the central pattern generator. So we use a very simple phase oscillator to generate a rhythmic leg motion. And the third point, this is a, a mainly important point of our approach. So uh, we hypothesize that uh, interim coordination in quadruped locomotion should rely more on physical communication between legs uh, through their body dynamic, less on neural communication. So in this experiment, we did not use the neural interaction between these phase operators uh, by exploiting just uh, local sensory feedback from a uh, pressure sensor in each leg. And finally, to generate pacing motion, we add a pendulum to generate oscillating. Uh, oscillating motion in the roll axis. And uh, this is a basic mechanism of our control. 
we propose the unconventional CPZ model. Uh, that component consists of phase oscillator and local sensor feedback. Describe this very simple equation. Uh, here, the phi i represents the oscillator phase, and omega is uh, intrinsic angular velocity of this oscillator. And uh, this second term represents local sensor feedback, and the sigma is magnitude of this local sensor feedback. And ni is the sensor information from each leg. Uh, this uh, is the ground reaction force detected by in each leg. And uh, uh, according to this oscillator phase, we control leg to be a swing phase from this phase to this phase, and to be stance phase from uh, this phase to this phase. And the effect of this local sensor feedback, when ni greater than zero, uh, phase is mainly modulated through power at this point which means that we design this local sensor feedback such that a leg remain in the stance phase while supporting the body. So you are interested in our research. Uh, please <laughs> come my poster. Thank you. <laughs>
an ankle power, ankle prosthesis, um, targeting a 90 kilogram person, uh, walking at a cadence of about 100 steps a minute, and targeting 10,000 um, steps with a single church, um, we can uh, provide this torque and velocity profile. Uh, and by optimizing the uh, passive and active element at the same time, we can achieve a better performance. So basically, if you repeat this operation for all the motors in our data set, we can get, um, we can get a list of available solution. And as you can see, uh, the solution that is, uh, is optimal in terms of motor weight is never the solution that is optimal in terms of total weight when we consider uh, the weight of the battery um, sum to the weight of the motor. So if we then repeat this for uh, different kind of um, configuration of the spring, for example, we obtain, we basically have an idea of how these passive components affect the design. And so we can educate our choice and uh, basically uh, decide if uh, adding more passive elements is, is, is worth uh, because of the complexity that they will add to the prosthesis. And what is relevant to us is that uh, the solution that has the, um, that are more efficient in terms of energy, the result not being the solution to are more efficient in terms of power versus weight ratio. And the same happens for the mechanical power. Thanks. All right, since we were waiting, let's start on uh, Fifth Street this morning. Okay, so this is a you know amateur video, obviously, but uh, the idea here is that I'm standing, I'm walk, I'm standing on the street. A big perturbation comes into my visual field. Okay, I decide not to fall over because I have not used that visual information as being critical for my uh, motor behavior of standing upright. So this idea certainly is not a new one and um, <coughs> can be characterized using frequency response functions. Um, in our lab and, and many other labs have done this. Uh, so to put it simply to start with, you could, have a, you could stand in a virtual scene like this and then we could rotate the virtual scene uh, about your ankles and then measure leg and trunk kinematics and then try to observe gain across a wide range of frequencies. And so as you can see here in the circles, you have a low amplitude. In the triangles, you have a high amplitude. That as you increase the amplitude of the visual scene motion, you have a decreased proportional response to the visual scene motion. OK, so the interpretation here is that this sensory source is now a less reliable source of sensory information for the motor behavior. OK, so how about um, we start to study sensory weighting and locomotion? OK, so this is not me. <laughs> this is a subject on a treadmill uh, experiencing visual scene perturbation. And we're measuring uh, you know, full body kinematics and EMG at multiple muscles on the right side. OK, and so you can, you can play the same games. You can start with the same set of tools, this uh, linear time invariant frequency response function, and look at trunk orientation. And you can see that, OK, we have the same effect where we have a uh, increased gain to the low amplitude stimulus and in indicating that, okay, we do have this sensory weighting occurring across a broad range of frequencies. Okay, but when we want to try to understand the other segments as well as musculature, this certainly does not hold and we must uh, take into account the gait cycle. So I'm going to spend some time explaining this um, <clears throat> way of presenting the data because it's critical for the impulse response functions we show later. So this is uh, data from a previous experiment in which I just used discrete scene perturbations while someone was walking on the treadmill. And what you can do is you can perturb that at various phases of the gait cycle. So I'll call that stimulus phase, and that's on the x-axis in the bottom. And then you can look at the response phase as you know, the evolution of the response as it occurs. These squiggly lines are, are uh, this is actually foot angle data. And the, um, the diagonal a uh, line would represent a stimulus onset. So uh, presenting data in this way you know, is certainly not new. Once again, um, perturbing locomotion in animal and animals and humans 
many people have done okay perturbations at certain phases and trying to understand what the phase dependence is. Um, what we can show here is that we have certain responses which may depend solely on uh, the response phase, that is, what is the state and how the state of the foot angle at that time can respond to all perturbations regardless of when you perturb them in the gate cycle. So this is regardless of stimulus phase, you get a similar response. But then there can be some interesting things where say at you know, mid stance you have a visual perturbation and you only have the response occurring within cycle um, <coughs> in this yellow box. So this idea that the, you know, it's stimulus phase dependent, so that it's a phase dependent response of the foot angle. Okay, so now we do impulse response functions at each stimulus phase and present data in the same way. And here's a hip motion, uh, just an indicator of, of whole body motion on the treadmill during these visual scene perturbations. And you can start to observe patterns of responses that occur. And what you can do then is you can take these patterns of responses in a low rotation condition and a high rotation condition, subtract them, and say, okay, is reweighting occurring in this uh, response variable, this hip motion? <clears throat> so you can see we have differences once you subtract as well. Okay, and then you can also do this in leg segments as well as a musculature to start to understand the varying degrees of muscular activation which are responsive to the visual scene motion. So these impulse response functions are, are deviations after subtracting mean, okay? <clears throat> so we can see responses there as well. Okay, so you can also uh, do an impulse response function of the estimated phase and show that, okay, we have an increased phase advance when we have a low rotation, low stimulus condition. So we see same principle of reweighting occurring in multiple ways, increasing, uh, changing in phase advances, and then we should discuss what the function of these actual responses may be, whether they be these response phase dependent or transient ones that I'm pointing out here at my poster. So thanks, and uh, I have to give thanks to my co our collaborators and uh, advertise Tim's talk tomorrow where he'll actually explain the impulse response function methods we use. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. My name is Sang Bae Kim. Uh, I uh, thank again my uh, uh, organizing committee let me uh, speak in uh, five minutes. So I'm gonna talk about just like uh, the state of update and how we uh, uh, developed this big, uh, Cheetah robot. So we designed this robot uh, 2009 uh, and this is the concept drawing on SolidWorks let me start the lab, and the, this is the last year picture. And today I'm gonna only talk about the uh, actuator side and efficiency. And this is the video we uh, showed last year. There's a uh, pulse transport one walking, one meter per second, and then about 2.3 meter per second pulse transport 0.51 last year. So I'm gonna show you a little, little more today. So the most importantly, uh, we've been talking about this forever, like what is the ideal actuator? How do we develop actuators so that we can make robots run like that? So obvious things I put there, uh, uh, obviously we want high power density, high torque density, and then we want to be able to control the impedance, and then we want it to be high bandwidth, obviously, and then we want high efficiency. So we thought uh, this is impossible, we have so much trouble developing many bits from the actuator. I'm gonna show you that it's actually possible. Um, start, people start believing that uh, actuator, uh, electric uh, actuator actually is a much higher power density than muscle. If you don't believe me, you can come to me after the uh, talk and then we can discuss more. And, uh, but the problem is their high power uh, is only available very low torque and high speed. That's why we, everybody uses a high gear reduction system, many, many different gear reduction systems. Now you have a trouble because the impedance control is difficult. So uh, we developed actually a way to, uh, we discovered this uh, scaling law that actually allows to do, get high power density in high, uh, low speed and high torque range. So now we can uh, make robot behave very differently. So uh, I'm not sure how many people can find this as uh, an interesting new way uh, of uh, making robot. There's no force sensor in this entire robot. So everything is for perceptive force control. And um, this is uh, probably, I, I, in my opinion, first time we show the, uh, the impedance control, including impact in high force range. So no spring, no force sensor. We uh, make it behave like that. It's very low spring, no damper. There's actually some damper in this, uh, uh, the bearing. This is a pure damping, no spring. I'm gonna skip to the high impedance side. This is a shock absorber, spring and damper. 
And if you crank up decently high, I cannot push it uh, with my arm. So we can actually generate very, very high impedance. So um, another advantage is having like this high, low impedance system with the uh, uh, different motor, we can actually regenerate much better. So we actually regenerate efficiency, uh, uh, including all this gear friction and uh, I score R, we got about 55% energy recovered. And this is a recent uh, video. At this point, there's no external sensing. We are working on it. So, but um, maybe I can make the sound here. Actually, very strange to look at like a trotting that fast. No animal run trot in that speed. And then this is the uh, what happened on uh, after the video we published on YouTube. So we failed in gate transition. Uh, many people ask what happened after that, and then, okay, I have to show something. So um, the slow motion, we uh, uh, intentionally change the phase difference and then uh, attempt to gate transition and. Uh, obviously, we, our force control wasn't uh, well implemented, so it, uh, pitch uh, goes unstable. So we're trying to uh, either uh, differentiate the uh, gate control front or rear leg, or get the pitch uh, sensor feedback to uh, achieve gallop. Right now, the speed is limited by treadmill. We uh, use a cheap treadmill, and uh, bandwidth is low, we, so we don't know actually the speed limit. If you're interested in control algorithm, uh, ask Dongjin uh, Hyun, raise your hand. So he's a designer of this controller, and um, I have to show this acknowledgement. So this is work is funded by DARPA. Uh, this is cost of transfer. I want to go really quickly. So 0.51 at six meter per second. Uh, about 20% is a mechanical loss, energy loss, and the gear bearing. Total power is still under 100, uh, one kilowatt. And Chira is uh, at the same level animal, about 20 times better than uh, hydro robots, uh, about four times better than Shimo. We built, uh, we're building a Chira version two, which can uh, run at 35 mile per hour at two kilowatts. So we're, we're very excited about it. They have a, a special motor designed by Jeff Lang, it's about three times torque density. Uh, so I don't wanna talk about all this. I believe it's actually better than muscle in many, many aspects. And I have a question. Tiger cannot run twice faster than Greyhound. What if, if you scaled our cheetah that way? And if you have any answer or let me, uh, uh, we can discuss. And this is actually, it will be shown by Dr. Hewon uh, Park tomorrow. Um, and this is an amazing controller. So uh, I wanted to uh, talk to him later. Thank you.